Hey there, welcome to another episode of More Than Money on All About Your Benjamins, the podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Dana Menard. Now, Dana's chapter begins on page 113 for those of you following at home. See my book there. Uh, the title is The American Dream. And rather than try to memorize all the accolades and things that Dana does, I'm going to read you his bio straight from the book. So, Dana is the founder and lead financial planner at Twin Cities Wealth Strategies. It's a fee-only fiduciary financial planning firm located in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area. He helps guide career-focused professionals, entrepreneurs, and small business owners through a proven process to help them lead a life of purpose, which we all know I love a life of purpose. He believes that everyone deserves real financial advice and not just to be sold financial products without first being thoroughly financially diagnosed. Dana is active in his local community and regularly volunteers his time in local schools, educating students on financial literacy topics. He's frequently uh, featured in both local and national financial news outlets. So with that, let me introduce you to Dana. We'll talk about his chapter of the American Dream. Hope you enjoy the episode and we'll see you all in the next episode. So, so Dana, how how many years have you been a financial advisor? Uh, I started right out of college back in 2002, so right okay. after 9-11 when everyone was hiring. Uh, it, it got my way into the industry based upon the fact that the only people hiring were financial advising firms mm-hmm. and insurance companies. So um, as much as luckily it aligned with what I was looking to do, um, at the same time, though, you know, it was one of the few places that were actually hiring. Mm-hmm. So, twenty years of experience. Congratulations right. on on that milestone. But Thank a little you. coming up on twenty one now. Um, yeah. Tons of tons of client stories. Tons of possibilities for what your chapter could have mm-hmm. been in the book. Uh, what was it about this particular story that made you choose it? You know, it uh, after dealing with hundreds of clients over the last 20 years, the biggest thing that I find when talking to people, and I work uh, predominantly with small business owners and entrepreneurs, is that when they're searching for financial advice, the standard model doesn't quite fit them. Uh, They're used to getting pitched insurance products, and as business owners, they get hit up all the time by the big companies trying to get, uh, you know, buy-sell agreements sold to them. But a lot of times what they're doing is they're also finding the firms that are money managers. And when they find out that these business owners who look great on paper have very little liquidity or liquid assets to invest, they find really, really fast that these firms lose interest quickly because they don't have a huge portfolio for them to manage. All of their money is essentially tied up in their business. Mm-hmm. So it's there's really no specific model for business owners to work with financial advisors that isn't more advice first as as we offer at Twin Cities Wealth Strategies is that we're trying to first find out what drives them. We do life planning through Kinder, and we're really trying to figure out first and foremost what drives them, what they want out of life before trying to pitch products, before trying to manage their money. We're getting down to the real nitty-gritty of what drives them. And business owners, typically, it's them, their families, and their businesses. That's really kind of the forte. And when you have a model that is... uh, standard in the industry, which is really heavy on product sales, they really get a bad taste in their mouth for it. So um, after talking with many, many business owners and finding that this is one of their biggest struggles and battles is finding advice versus products or, you know, kind of a uh, one size fits all philosophy that a lot of firms use for, um, you know, the the typical W two employee, which you know they're told to accumulate all of their money, invest all of their money. It's perfect for uh, these firms to work with, um, mm-hmm. where the business owner is really more concentrated on investing in themselves, investing in their business, and it's really kind of a they kind of come to head many times. And uh, that was why I started Twin Cities Well Strategies was I was talking to a lot of these business owners who had basically given up on searching for financial advice because they were constantly getting barraged with either life insurance sales or uh, 
have to have at least a million dollars of investable assets before we'll talk to you or give you any advice on anything. So it's really kind of the the story that I was presenting in, in the book was a couple that had uh, an advertising agency and they had just kind of hit the wall after trying to find a financial advisor to work with that would help walk them through at least first thing they wanted to figure out was were they doing the right things right now Mm -hmm. versus you know let's let's gather all of your assets and invest it in a portfolio or hey let's let's get you uh you know full of of life insurance when that wasn't what they necessarily needed they just wanted to know are we doing the right things with our money should we be doing other things are there other options out there that we should be looking at and it was a pretty simple question just something that they weren't able to get an answer from anybody else on i want to i want to hang with george kinder a little bit more yeah. uh, because i you know recording all these episodes. So if, if somebody's listening to all of the episodes, my, my guess is you're going to hear about George a lot. Just got off done recording with Elliot. Um, and mm-hmm. I don't know how these episodes are going to come out, but Elliot talked about life planning as well. So I mm-hmm. asked Elliot to go through the three kinder questions. I won't ask you to do the same thing. If you're listening, and you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out Elliot's uh, episode. <laughs> but what is it about like, what is it about the life planning process that really spoke to you and aligns Mm -hmm. with the way you want to work with your clients. So uh, I'm sure Elliot touched on this a lot when when he was discussing it, especially going through the three questions. But that alludes to just the process of having a conversation with people. Mm -hmm. Um, When people are coming in initially with questions, most advisors, and we're all trained this way, is to try to come up with an answer as fast as possible. Come up show our knowledge, prove to them that we are the smartest people in the room and that's why they need to hire us. But uh, the kinder method really kind of flips that whole process on its head and it allows you and allows the client space to essentially talk it out themselves. Where it's, it's a guided conversation where we're doing essentially 2% of the talking and they are really opening up, we're giving, you know, asking questions and more questions and more questions and kind of going down the rabbit hole and getting them to start talking about what really matters most to them versus show me your your balance statement, you know, show me your numbers, show me all of the all of your assets and let's start investing this and and it's it really kind of gives them the opportunity to figure out what matters most to them and us as the advisor to kind of help them bring it out and to the forefront and allow them to really do some of that adventure work, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, themselves versus us telling them what they need. It's allowing them to really come up with it themselves. And we're working kind of as the guide to help them through that versus, you know, come to me, Here's the one, two, three that you need. Sign on the dotted line. Boom. Everybody's getting the same advice in cookie cutter portfolios. Um, so it's it's really the process that I think once you go through it, and I was I always kind of thought it was a, a little foo foo, and, <laughs> and until you go through it yourself, and when you go through the training, your life planned along with another planner, and you each life plan each other, and until you go through the process, you don't really get it. You know, you always hear, oh, you should always listen more than what you talk. But at the same time, that goes almost against how we in the industry were all taught the sales method of getting clients is, you know, show how smart you are, tell them what they need, show them the product that is going to fix their lives and give them all the things that they need and make, make that product do all of the things, you know, make it the Swiss army knife. And we've all probably have seen it or experienced it at some point where somebody is talking not about your personal situation, but about a certain product that can do certain things. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting to the real nitty gritty of what drives people and what they want out of a relationship with a financial advisor, I have not found anything that even touches the kinder method. And and that's why I'm excited about like this series of podcast episodes Mm -hmm. and the book, because it, you know, most people don't. Most people, when they think about a financial advisor, they don't think about the Kinder method. Right. They don't think about life planning. They think more about the sales product. So, you mm-hmm. know, as you know, one of the co-founders of the community, when this book came, I was really hoping that it would show people what real financial planning looks like, which is why it's real right. life stories of planning. 
going back to your chapter without giving mm-hmm. away too much, I and mean, we talked a little bit on it, but you didn't give away all the exciting stuff. <laughs> what's the, what's the main message you hope readers take away from it? Now, the the main message is kind of alluded back to what I was talking about earlier. Was that uh, you know not all financial advisors are the same. Um, you know, although we all use that same title, financial advisor, um, you can find just about any type of advisor for any type of situation. Mm-hmm. Even though what we mostly are, are are pushed on us or that we see in the news or advertisements or on the side of stadiums are the big names, you know. Uh, I won't mention any of them here. Everybody knows them. But there are advisors that work in other capacities that aren't necessarily owned by insurance companies or banks or brokerage houses. And the way that they work with their clients is completely different. Uh, now, granted, you have to kind of search for them because you know 95 ish percent of the industry is bank and insurance companies uh so it's it's a little bit more difficult and they don't necessarily have that big budget that a lot of these other firms do but at the end of the day you can find them and a lot of times it just takes a little bit of proact proactivity where you're you're doing some diligence yourself and you're doing the searches and you know you can go to many places uh cfp board has has a site that you can search for advisors fpa has a a, a site that you can use to search for advisors uh napfa the fioni network just to name a few you can even go through uh, uh the NA or it used to be the NASD, but FINRA and the SEC, you can search and you can do background checks on everybody out there. Uh, you can get a good idea of the type of firm that they work for, uh, their business models, how they work with clients. It's all available, but most people just don't know that it's available to them and that they can do that search themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was one of the biggest. And of course, the just the, the, the fact that there are advisors out there that are fee only that are advice only some are hourly some will do um you know by the project um some like myself are ongoing full service fee only fee for service type of advisors and we're not necessarily selling products and the downside is is that there's a lot of people out there that call themselves advisors that are really sales people at the end of the day I think one of the cool things about the community and also about mm-hmm. kind of you alluding to there's different types of advisors is mm-hmm. that, you know, not every advisor is out to try to work with everybody. And I think the positive to that and positive you'll see in the book is that we as advisors, there's a, there's a lot of us out there that just want to mm-hmm. see you, the consumer, have a good experience. So if it's right. not with us, like if you're not a small business owner or entrepreneur, you know, Dana, you might not be the right advisor for them and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But we want to make sure you find another good advisor, whether it's through those sources or through the networks that we have. But Mm -hmm. you're seeing more and more advisors like yourself that are more collaborative and realize that a rising tide lifts all ships. So Mm -hmm. if we make sure that we are letting people know about all the ways that advisors work, in addition to the Mm -hmm. way that we do, and helping them find a good advisor, then more people will have a good experience with financial advisors and will start to shake some of those bad reputations that our profession has rightly owned. So... I think your story highlights that of just that, again, there are advisors out there that will help you with what it is that you need. And I think the other thing that's good about your chapter is that sometimes people don't know what they, what they really want Mm -hmm. and they don't know what to ask an advisor because their perception of us is, well, it's just investment. It's just product. So when they sit down with an advisor, this is what I'm supposed to get. Well, for some people that might be the right answer for them, but for others who want more, who Mm want to be pushed, who want to find that life, to know that there's an advisor like you that's out there and more that are really about helping people create a life is a good thing to know. And I think with a chapter like yours that lets people understand that. Um, I'm going to go to misconceptions of financial advisors and you can't use what you've already said. So I, we, Ooh, that's we, tough. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I'm not going to make it easy. It's all right. You've, you've already, you've already covered one misconception about us is that we're not all, we're not all sales oriented. Right. What's another misconception about financial advisors that you would like people to um, realize may not be true. Mm-hmm. Now I think, I think one of it is that for so long, a lot of advisors have had that idea that other advisors are competition. And I don't think that that's necessarily it, especially when you've got groups like the AGC, which is one of the main reasons why I joined. I love to see 
other advisors help each other out. None of us works for, for the same firms. We're all competitors in that sense, but we're all out there to help improve the industry and improve the profession because I think financial planning can truly be a 100% profession where in today's world, everybody sees the word again, financial advisor, and they all kind of lump it all into the same in the same category. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I think most financial advisors are really out there trying to do what's best for their clients. Now, maybe the firms that they work for don't truly allow them to do all of the things, but usually with the toolbox and the tool belt that they're given, they can do a lot of good. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you've, if you've, uh, alluded at all to any of the other episodes of the uh, Vanguard Advisor study, I think a lot of people can learn from just that study alone of looking and seeing, you know, just by having somebody to get advice from increases your ability to be successful in your financial life. And when you stack a bunch of people that are not necessarily competitors, but are brethren and sisters that help each other out and kind of figure out, okay, what are things that are working? What are things that aren't working? And we work together collaboratively. So many great things come out of it. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that we're we're enemies and we're trying to take each other's clients because that's not at all how it works. There's way more people out there that need financial advice than there are financial advisors. And I think it's more of a blue ocean situation. Yeah. As I say, one of the cool things that comes out is a book that mm-hmm. I, I wanted I want to double back on something real quick because yeah. there's a chance that there might be some financial advisors that are watching and listening to this as well. Um, mm-hmm. Just given the audience of all about your Benjamins, and you know we are keeping idea, keeping tap of what every, everybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to your comment about there are advisors that may be at firms that don't allow them to do everything um, the way they might want to do it. And the reason mm-hmm. I want to highlight that is one, if you are if you're somebody working with an advisor that has a heart of being an advisor and is doing the best they can within the constraints, right. that's not necessarily a bad thing. And if you are an advisor that finds yourself in an environment where maybe you don't have all of the options that an independent fee-only advisor might have, but you have the heart of a planner and you're doing what's right for your clients, that's okay as well. And I I highlight that because for seven years of my career, I worked at a a firm that was owned by an insurance company. And while I had some freedom with what I could do, it wasn't what I have today when I own my own RIA. But I don't believe that made me a less advisor. (laughs) I did the best that I could. I put my clients first within some constraints, knowing that eventually my goal was to go independent so the constraints would be left. But I would not have made it and my clients would no longer have an advisor if I wasn't at that 403B company for seven years because I'm not a eat what you kill person. I'm not an aggressive salesperson. Being in that environment where I could help teachers and slowly grow a book of business that one day might follow me was the right place for me at that time. And I did good work for my clients, which is why they, I have a firm today because they followed me. So anyways, yeah. the point of that soapbox statement was just that if you have an advisor that you know that you trust and genuinely has your best interest at heart, but they may be at a firm that isn't the best firm, that's okay. And if you're an advisor mm-hmm. there, that doesn't make you less of an advisor. Um, again, as long as you're doing what's right for your clients at the best of your ability, um, they're going to be in good shape. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's not a message I think gets told enough. And in our profession, right. we get a lot of dumping on other advisors. Um, Very much so. So a fun question. Yeah. I want us as advisors to be vulnerable. And this is where the surprise question comes in. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the surprise question now. So if you're <laughs> first time listening, I sent everybody over a list of questions. Um, this one's not on there. So the one I'll, I'll ask you first, because I'm an optimist, is what is your best financial decision? But in the... Um, And being fully transparent and being vulnerable as -hmm. an advisor, I also want to hear about your worst financial decision as well. So since you didn't know that was there, I'll give you a second to think. Mm -hmm. What's your best uh, financial decision? Uh, Best one would have been investing in myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Much like you were talking about earlier, I started off with uh, an insurance company that was, you know, owned, that owned the firm. So everything was through the scope of selling insurance first, hitting certain sales goals, even though we're still financial advisors, the first thing you had to do is try to get that sale because if you didn't, you didn't eat. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it was good training. I also 
don't consider myself a salesy person. I feel that if people want something, they're going to find it. They don't need to be hammered over the head with it to, 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 to figure out that it's something that they necessarily need. So I've always been very, 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 you know, stand back and just kind of say, okay, here's what your options are. Now it's your choice. And then I leave it at that. But um, that's why I ended up starting my own firm. I started putting my my money towards my education, my CFP, my uh, ultimately at the end of the day, figuring out what the things that I wanted to be able to provide to clients where I wasn't able to do that at my previous firm. By starting my own, I was able to essentially do whatever I wanted, um, you know, obviously within confines of, of legality, but, you know, I was, I at the previous firm, there was no social media use. That was a big no-no, and blogging was a no-no, video was a no-no, and all of these things where that's what people were watching and seeking out to get the initial advice versus cold calling people. Um, that's where I found that, you know, the investing in myself ended up being the best investment. Um, on the flip side, the worst investment was probably not taking the plunge earlier and being kind of my own worst enemy of, you know, I was in conversations with, uh, with Alan Moore and Michael Kitsis for mm -hmm. probably three years before I left the old firm and started my own. I always had it in the back of my mind that I was going to do it, but I think that, you know, obviously hindsight is always twenty twenty. but I think what I would tell most people today is if it's something that you want and you foresee it being something that you're going to do eventually, do it yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the longer you wait, the harder it is and the more obstacles you have to overcome. The earlier you do it and the faster you rip the Band-Aid off, the better. Um, I think that, that initial discomfort is a good thing. It helps you push through. And I think uh, so many people feel that it's just going to ultimately just happen automatically without them having to do any of the hard work. It's essentially like... Uh, passive income. I don't think there's anything passive about passive income. Mm -hmm. And so many people feel that you can just do something, set it and forget it and money will just come. And there's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that you don't see. And I think that has a lot to do the same thing with, with investing in yourself, regardless of what it is that you want to ultimately do. I'm going to piggyback on that, add one extra comment just to sum mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. Um, another thing when you think about like make the leap sooner, a lot of times people don't leap because of this reason today. You know, it's mm -hmm. you know, the, the kids are, are young. Well, like there's always going to be something yes. that you could justify not making the leap. So I do think that there's a point of you need to do some planning. But then right. once you get the basic planning done and you've done it all, like you do need to make the leap because there's always going to be a reason for you to talk yourself out of it. And just like mm -hmm. you, I wish I would have started my business sooner. So I, I, <laughs> I love both of those. Um, all right, so the, the final question is just kind mm -hmm. of looping back to the book. What was, what was the reason you wanted to participate in the project? Because it was a, a commitment. You, know, you, had to, mm -hmm. you had to write your chapter. You had to revise it. Some of us had to revise it multiple times. Um, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a natural writer. <laughs> what made you want to participate in the project? Oh, one, I thought it was a good opportunity to, one, get the industry um, and how it actually operates and real stories versus just what a lot of people hear and experience, which I don't think truly line up correctly. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people have had bad experiences, and I've talked to many, that by the time they get to me, they've had two, three, four horrible experiences with quote-unquote financial advisors. And I wanted to, to really kind of open up the hood and show people what it really could be like, even though the one out of, what is it, 28 stories that are in the book, mm -hmm. the, the one that I told is completely different from the other 28. And so many people feel like there's, this, there's only one way and one experience that can be had by working with a financial advisor, when in fact, there are many ways. And sometimes a certain product may be exactly what that person needs. And that's great. And there are advisors out there that fit that model perfectly. But there are a lot of people out there that have that have not at all 
started the process of looking for an advisor because they've heard horror stories or they've had a bad experience. And I really wanted to kind of get that out to the front that that is not at all the normal experience that people have when they truly work with a real financial advisor versus a salesperson. And it's, it's, it, and if you've, once you read through all of the stories, you really, really get an, ex, an idea that there's no one size fits all model. There really is not. Well, we have to give a quick shout out as we wrap up. You mentioned real financial planners, real financial advisor. Mm-hmm. I see the Carl Richards illustration <laughs> in the back. Of so course. We, have to give, we have to give Carl Richards a shout out. He's, he's a friend of the community. He was a part of the launch of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has coined kind of the real financial advisor uh, terminology as well. So shout out to Carl for first off giving you some awesome artwork and then everything he does for us as the community, as a uh, profession <laughs> as well. Uh, well, Dana, I want to thank you for taking the time out, first off, for sharing your story and helping this book bring stories of real financial planning to the consumers. I also have a part of me that hopes that there are advisors out there that you know they don't know what they don't know. They've mm-hmm. grown up in a certain world of the financial planning profession, and they don't know that this type of planning is out there. So it also opens up the eyes of the planners. That's why I love this book. I think it's for everybody, not just because mm-hmm. I'm a part of it, but I genuinely believe it's for the consumer and for the advisor. So thank you for contributing to that. And then also thank you for taking time on a, a Friday afternoon to come chop it up with me and, and talk about the book and, and more. So I appreciate that. Um, if anybody wants to give you some feedback on, hey, I loved your chapter. This was great. Like, Where can they find you out on social media just to, to show you some love on the chapter? Yeah, certainly. The uh, easiest way to find me on social is uh, Facebook, of course, Twin Cities Wealth Strategies, or I believe it's uh, TC Wealth. Uh, Twitter, at TC Wealth. Um, Instagram, TC Wealth. And, of course, uh, TCWealthStrategies.com is an easy place to find me as well. And if not, I'll, you can find me in the AGC. There you go. I'll, I'll, I'll link to all those on the show notes as, as we do on the podcast. So, Sounds Dana, good. Thank you. thanks again. Everybody, thank you for tuning in and watching or listening. If you've bought the book, thank you for supporting the book. Again, uh, we didn't mention it here in this conversation, but it's been throughout them. Mm-hmm. All of the proceeds from More the Money from the AGC side goes to, uh, right now, the BLX, which is a, mm-hmm. an internship program, and then also for the Foundation of Financial Planning. So all of the proceeds – go to different organizations within the financial planning community to move the profession forward, bring advice to more people, and tell these great stories. It's not for us to make some money. So thank exactly. you for supporting. If you haven't supported, consider that um, and go out and grab a copy. Read Dana's chapter. It starts on page 113 um, as you make your way through the book. So with that, I'll let everybody go. Dana, thanks again. Thanks to all of you, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Yep. Thanks, Justin.